This foreign-backed opposition coalition have stopped short of supporting military action against Israel's aggression on Syrian soil. A member of the opposition has said they will only use diplomatic and political means to halt Israel's military action against Damascus. The comments come after Tel Aviv launched a deadly airstrike on Syrian soil. U.S. officials have said the attack targeted a missile convoy and a military research center suspected of housing chemical agents. Israel has also deployed its missiles near the Syrian border. The Syrian government has said it holds Israel and its allies responsible for the rising tensions. The Syrian army has warned Israel not to test the country's military capabilities. Well, from Washington, I'm joined by Dr. Webster Griffin Topley, author and historian. Welcome to the program. So, Doctor, uh, we see a soft stance by the uh, Syrian armed forces towards the Israeli aggression on Syria, on the research center there. Uh, how should one interpret such a move? Well, on the, on the surface, of course, it's an outrageous violation of the UN Charter. It's an act of naked aggression, uh, a threat to international peace and security. Under normal circumstances, we should have an emergency session of the UN Security Council, which I, th I imagine is being blocked by the NATO powers in the background. And of course, Russia has condemned it very strongly. Iran has condemned it strongly. And it shows, once again, that the Israelis really are incorrigible aggressors. It may have something to do, uh, in passing, with Netanyahu forming a cabinet. Maybe this is a, a gesture to help him get some uh, lunatic uh, right-wing party into his, into his government. But I think we can also take a step back. This is a provocation, and it's a diversion. I think it all started around midweek when Khatib, the head of the Syrian National Coalition, the new puppet group, not the old one, but the new one, said that he wanted to have talks with the Assad government. He said, let's, have, let's start negotiations with Assad. And at that point, things began to happen around the world. Brahimi of the UN said, that's wonderful, let's do it right away. Ban Ki-moon uh, was delighted. But then at the White House, we had Jay Carney freaking out, saying, no, no, Assad must leave, Assad must leave. And I think people interpreted this call from Khatib as a sign that the Syrian rebellion may be near collapse. Otherwise, he's basically asking for an armistice. He's asking for a truce. Why would he do that? Not if he's winning, but if he's losing. And at that point, the Israelis rush in with the bombing, and we have a bombing also at the UN, the U.S. Embassy in, uh, in Turkey. Now, all of that doesn't exactly help the uh, Syrian National Coalition and the Free Syrian Army, because they are acutely embarrassed, because now it's clear who they are. They're in a united front with Israel. They're the infantry of the uh, Israeli Defense Forces, uh, very, very embarrassing for them. They claim, originally they claimed that the, the Israeli bombing was not the Israelis, but some mortar shells that the Syrian rebels had fired. And now the, the, the latest thing I heard an hour or two ago was that the Syrian rebels are attacking Assad because he doesn't have the guts to attack uh, the Israelis. And of course, why would he? This is close to the border. The wreckage of the plane might fall within Israel. It might be a pretext that could be used Indeed. for further attacks on Syria. But I think it all underlines the growing weakness of the Syrian rebel coalition. And so very briefly, Doctor, as far as the situation is concerned, how close are we to seeing war rather than dialogue? I think the, the reason for war is that the, the rebellion may be collapsing. And at that point, all the countries that have put so much effort and investment into this uh, rebel uh, coalition of death squads, terrorists, al-Nusra, and so forth, they're confronted with the fact that their entire tactic may fail. Uh, and a lot of careers are bound up with that, and a lot of uh, prestige for the United States, the Israelis, the French, uh, various other NATO states, the British, to be sure. And it seems to me the main danger right now is a freak out coming from the NATO and Israeli side. If they see what's going on and that they're, they're, they're about to lose big, they may take some kind of a flight forward. I think that's the main danger right now. There will be a meeting at the Wehrkunde in uh, Munich, uh, Germany, tomorrow with Biden, Lavrov, and, and Brahimi. So that might um, yield some interesting results. But Indeed. generally, 
it's, it's a, a, a freak out by the Western powers, I think. That's the main danger. Hello, everyone. Welcome to GGN. Today is Friday, February 8th, 2013. I'm Darko. My website is ggnonline.com. And on YouTube, DDarko2012 and 2013 are my YouTube channels. Okay, so I'll start off with this article here. Dutch citizens joining Syrian militants, spy chief says. The chief of the Netherlands' main intelligence agency says dozens of Dutch citizens have gone to Syria to join the militants fighting against the government of Assad. He said, in my view, that is very worrying because of the combat experience they acquire, the ideological convictions, and the fact that they could become traumatized there. He went on to say hundreds of Europeans have traveled to the Arab country to join the foreign-backed militants. United States plans to increase aid to Syrian people. Of course, it's not going to get in there because I guess there's some kind of uh, deal with them having to be able to get across the border and the Syrian government isn't allowing them because, you yeah, this is this is part of the uh, this is part of the humanitarian mission. You got to go in there and, and 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 create chaos with the death squads, like Tarpley calls them, and then uh, then you got like you know thousands of people that are fleeing that would normally be there having to leave their homes, and then of course you go there and you be the kind of the helper, the humanitarian, the one who actually caused all of this, uh, like in Mali right now. U.S. officials say they are working to gain greater access for humanitarian assistance to the Syrian people, and while the regime has recently allowed aid into parts of the country previously impassable, more still needs to be done. So, White House cites threat to Israel in explaining decision not to arm rebels. So they're talking about, oh, we should have armed the rebels. We should have armed the rebels, remember? Uh, and the president saying, no, we cannot do that. We're good people, or we're humanitarians who stay out of other countries' business, right? White House on Friday defended its decision not to endorse the CIA plan to arm the Syrian rebels, uh, saying it was worried that the U.S. weapons could fall into the wrong hands and worsen the situation in the civil war torn country. So uh, pretty interesting uh, because they did that in Libya and their ambassador got killed by the same people they were arming. Uh, and then that's what you're seeing now with Mali and in Syria, the results of that. In his remarks, Press Secretary Jay Carney specifically mentioned danger to our ally, our Zionist ally Israel, as one of the reasons Obama uh, rejected providing lethal aid to the rebels. We don't want to, any weapons to fall in the wrong hands, potentially further endanger the Syrian people, our ally Israel, or the United States. Al-Qaeda ex-spy minister calls for strong ties with Al-Qaeda. So this is kind of some conflicting reports. Israeli's uh, foreign minister, or foreign military intelligence chief has called for the Zionist regime's stronger ties with Al-Qaeda. So he goes on and says here, he's quoted by Jerusalem Post, saying that Israel should strengthen its relationship with emerging Sunni forces in Syria to confront the big enemy, which is Iran. So we already covered this, but I'm just going to throw it in there with it. Israel, Al-Qaeda, two sides of the same coin in Syria. Two sides of the U.S.-dominated imperial system, Israel and Al-Qaeda are, and uh, they wage a war on independent nation and nations of Syria tending to destroy that country, said Eric Dreister, the founder of StopImperialism.com. So when I saw this article, White House cites threat to Israel in explaining the decision not to arm rebels. I was like, okay, you know, the, somebody's missing the talking points, right? They can, you can only put out so much disinformation, misinformation, uh, without it, you know, conflicting with each other. Then Maine girls uh, hoops players scolded at the disturbing Nazi salute. Varsity girls basketball program in southern Maine finds itself under fire for the ugliest actions imaginable. Drone bombing uh, children in Pakistan? Uh, no. Uh, torturing innocent people in the name of the war on terror? No. Spraying chemicals in the sky, poisoning the water? No. Giving a Nazi salute? That's right. The same thing the former... Uh, governor of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger, did. Again, you can see the conflicting uh, um, things right here that are pushed. So, you know, if it's Arnold, it's okay. But if it's them, it's bad. All over uh, Yahoo right now. So the salute and ugly tweets that surfaced were apparently a disturbing reference to the three girls' dislike of a particular Jewish teammate, with the trio also tweeting multiple references to Hitler and other anti-Semitic trains of thought. And uh, so, you know, you've seen George Bush do it, uh, the, the salute and all that, and other people. But uh, they don't mention that. They just, you know, when it comes to, this, when it comes to the plebes of the slaves, then they, you know, they got to call it out. Uh, flames of hate, right? That's what it is. Well, racist fans torch Israeli club's office. So it goes on here. It says the headquarters of Israeli football club in Jerusalem has been torched on Friday by a group of the Israeli Zionist racist fans protesting against the signing of two Muslim players. So, 
The club's supporters, who are widely known for their right-wing political views, talking about in Israel here, reacted immediately as the Jerusalem side's next game uh, was marred by racist anti-Arab chants and banners saying uh, this Beitar will always remain pure. So this is how it is. And, I, you know, I tried looking for the article from the Time magazine recently um, about Israel and about the, uh, the Likud party, basically. And Natyanu and his uh, opposition, the opposition was actually more far right than he was. And the opposition leader was surprised that so many people supported them and they got so, uh, so many votes in the last minute there. And the thing is, is that the youth, 17 to 25, the majority of them said they don't want peace, they don't want a two-state solution, and, um, and they want a big, uh, uh, basically a dictator, authoritarian, to tell them what to do. They want a pure Israel. So you're talking about... You're talking about racism? I'm so sick of hearing about this crap. You know, over in Israel, they got some of the most racist people in the world. Three Jews indicate, uh, indicted for hate crimes against Palestinians, price tag actions against innocent people and their property were chosen because they're Arab and were meant to convey various messages in violent and offensive ways. Three Jews were indicted yesterday for allegedly committing hate crimes against Palestinians. They set the car on fire and spray graffiti Next up, uh, Press TV, an eye film taken off the air in the U.S. and Canada. So this is part of the sanctions, I guess. So another flagrant violation of freedom of speech. Iranian channels, Press TV, and eye film have been uh, removed from the Galaxy 19 satellite platform. It's not the first time Iranian media has been targeted. Remember, the Spanish government ordered Madrid's government to stop the broadcast of the Spanish language channel, Hispan TV, also Utilsat. Uh, French-Israeli CEO blamed, is blamed for the recent wave of attacks on Iranian media in Europe. So, Back then, the move was immediately welcomed by the American Jewish community, which called it an important development in worldwide efforts to contain Iran's media influence. Kerry repeats allegations about Iran nuclear programs. So, uh, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has repeated the unfounded allegations about Iran's peaceful nuclear energy program. Like I said, whether it's peaceful or not, they have the right to defend themselves against uh, other countries that have nuclear weapons. It says uh, Iran has a choice. They have to prove to the world that it is peaceful. Huh. Inter interesting. The international community, again, on a lot that body of um, uh, a-holes, is ready to respond if Iran comes to prepare to talk real substance and to address concerns that could not be more clear about their nuclear program. If they don't, then they will choose to leave themselves more isolated. And see, what they're actually doing when they isolate Iran, what they're actually doing is pushing them in a corner, which will then lead to um, them getting hostile if they're provoked, right? I mean, I've covered this before by analysts. You know, not really too much bias there. They're just telling it what it is, how it is. Five reasons Iran is not a threat to the U.S. They never attacked the U.S or even any of our interests overseas. In fact, they've not attacked or invaded anyone in at least 270 years. They have claims of nuclear weapon, like I said. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Self-preservation, Iran will not attack West military with a nuclear weapon because they know they would be inviting their immediate destruction, which is true. And uh, surrounded by U.S. bases, over 45 U.S. bases surround Iran. These bases are in addition to the fleets of U.S. warships parked in the waters near Iran. So you have Zionist-friendly Saudi Arabia. Uh, you got the war going on in Afghanistan, drone bombing people in Pakistan. So, you know, they got it pretty much covered. Turkey, who will do anything uh, to get into the EU. So it's like they said, yeah, I guess you can see who the real threat is here. And just another article talking about how Iran is not attacking another country in over 200 years. Poll shows overwhelming U.S. opposition to attacking Iran. They don't want to get involved if Israel attacks either. Actually, there's polls from Israel uh, saying that Israelis don't want them to attack. We're at war, and we have been since 1776, 214 years of American war making. In other words, there are only 21 calendar years in which the U.S. did not wage any wars. Pick any year since 1776, there's a 91% chance that America was involved in some war. No U.S. president truly qualifies as a peacetime president. So, they're war presidents. The U.S. has never gone a decade without war, and the only time the U.S. went five years without war, 1935 to 40, was during the isolationist period of the Great Depression, which, of course, they carried out a false flag in order to get people to go to war. Israeli commander says invasion of Lebanon would mean lasting calm, insists that Israel ready for another invasion of their neighbor. Israel hasn't invaded Lebanon since the summer of 2006, which is considered by many as unusually long gap between incursion and 12 Israeli warplanes violate Lebanese airspace.
Thank you.